Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel, and this is part of the good stuff. This is the AAS uh, Scientific Editor Series, and I am super happy to have Scientific and OzGrab Editor with us today, Ilya Mandel. Hi, Ilya. Hi, Frank. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you so much for A, being willing to talk about uh, what you do as a scientific editor and your research we'll get to. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate that. Very cool. Um, Ozgrab, where is Ozgrab? <clears throat> oh, sorry, I, I just moved out of the way. So Ozgrab is a um, center of excellence, um, which is a large center, multi-university center funded by the Australian Research Council. So as you can guess, it's located in Australia, uh, spans uh, multiple nodes in Australia. And this one is dedicated to the search for gravitational waves and the interpretation of gravitational waves. Um, amazingly, it was actually funded before gravitational waves were first detected in uh, uh -huh. late 2015. So, so um, the Australian government in this case, or the Research Council, were very wise uh, in foresight. their foresight. Um, absolutely. So, of course, you know, it's we've been very fortunate to have uh, uh, been present during the and participated in, in all of the exciting detections that have been made in recent years. And I'm personally based at, at Monash University, which is one of the nodes of Osgrave, and that's in Melbourne in Australia. Very cool. Very cool. And it is, uh, well, my May 19th. It's Ilya's May 20th as we shoot this. Um, so let's see, the power switch got um, <clears throat> thrown in Phoenix about two days ago. Uh, and so we went over, we got up to about 106F, so 35, 36C, somewhere in that range. Um, so Australia, you must be coming up on winter. We are. It's it's uh, uh, late <laughs> autumn here. Um, and by the way, it's it's kind of nice, you know, being, you know, living in the future relative to you. So I can, uh, you know, if you ever need any any information about, you know, whether tomorrow will actually arrive. Um, I don't know if you ever re read, you know, Asterix and Obelix uh, as a kid, but 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 uh, you know, the, the, if you remember, there's a there's a chief of the village there who mm -hmm. is afraid of nothing except that the sky will fall on his head tomorrow. But fortunately, tomorrow never comes. Well, I have a disappointment for the for the for the chief. Tomorrow does come because we live in tomorrow, and I, it's I, it, <clears throat> it's fine. It's fine. It's manageable. It's, 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 it's a little cool. Not not thirty six degrees, well, but I, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to, to know that my tomorrow will be absolutely fantastic. That's wonderful. It will be. It'll be great. <clears throat> that's an awesome beach behind you. What is that? Where um, is that's it? actually um, a place along the Great Ocean Road, which is a really beautiful uh, road that connects. Um, well, it goes from Melbourne. Um, in the direction of Adelaide, doesn't quite make it all the way to Adelaide, uh, but, uh, or at least, it, well, it does, but that part is not called the Greater Ocean Road anymore, I suppose, but but the parts near Melbourne are, are really fantastic. And uh, yeah. yeah, actually, if, if if you or any of the viewers haven't been to Australia, I highly recommend it. Uh, I, as you can tell from the accent, I'm not originally Australian. I've only moved here about three years ago, but I've been uh, enjoying it very much in the time that I've been here. Very cool, very cool. I'll take that as an open invitation. So I will finally, Please. perhaps one day, finally see the Southern sky, you know, and, and enjoy all that. I've been to the Southern Hemisphere a couple of times, but every time I go, it's completely clouded out and I never see anything. It's really a bummer. <laughs> you, you, you should definitely come. Australia has, um, you know, lots of open, empty spaces. So it's not like that, that difficult to, to get to places where you don't have too much light pollution. And uh, um, so, yeah. Uh, highly recommended. Very cool. Very cool. Ilya, what do you like to do for research? So, well, as I guess you gathered, I one of the things I'm interested in are gravitational waves. Um, and uh, that's been sort of a, an ongoing theme of my research over the past 20 years. But uh, um, I, I think I have a, a form of scientific attention deficit disorder. So I get very quickly, very bored with uh, working on the same topic. And so I tend to move around quite a bit. Um, um, I also realized, in, I started out as a sort of thinking that I would be a proper theoretical physicist, and I realized, eh, my mathematical skills are probably not quite up to par to be a good theoretical physicist. And then I thought, well, you know, I have a, uh, a bit of a background in computer science, and I thought, okay, maybe I could be a computational um, physicist. And then I decided, well, I'm a little too lazy to be a proper computational physicist, also too impatient. I just cannot... I'm happy enough when somebody else tells me that they've run some nice code and, and got the results uh, three months later, but yeah. somehow, and I'm, you know, I collaborate with people who do those kinds of things, but, but I just don't have the patience to wait for three months for a result. So I became a back of the envelope phenomenological astrophysicist. There you go. Which is, um, I suppose, you know, the fun for me is that, that um, I, I get to say that I know nothing about a whole lot of different things. Um, so, um, 
yeah, not sure about the jack of all trades part, but the master of none is definitely uh, oh, yeah. part of the agenda. Um, and uh, so I play around with binary evolution and stellar evolution. I play around with uh, things that go boom in the night, gamma ray bursts, tidal disruption events, gravitational waves. Um, I oh, like God. astrophysics, um, but I also have ventured uh, much in dynamics, things like that. But I also venture much further afield. So I've uh, played around with uh, paleoclimatology, for example. So what mm. was climate like 100 million years ago, mm. uh, collaborating with uh, yeah. some um, geographers and earth scientists on mm. uh, trying to use uh, proxies for, um, for example, there are archaea bacteria that leave behind various biomarkers. And you can try to figure out from these biomarkers by calibrating them to modern data, what the temperature was like at the time when dinosaurs roamed the earth, which Very is pretty cool. cool. Very nice. Very nice. I love it. You're a Renaissance man. Thank you. I'll, I'll take it as a compliment. <laughs> I mean, it is a compliment. <laughs> it is. Absolutely. It is. Yeah, there are people who are definitely wide, and I, I appreciate uh, uh, width, but I think you go a little bit deeper than you're hinting on to. I think I've seen one or two of those software creations of yours floating around, so it's all good. It's all good. Cosmic, for one. Um, uh, so you've been doing a lot of stuff over 20 years. Do you happen to recall when your first AAS journal article was? I do. I well, I, I had a, a guess. I actually had to check. I have to admit. Uh, um, but uh, um, the first article was um, in. I think it was published in two thousand eight. Um, uh, written in two thousand seven, and it was uh, actually the very end of my PhD. Um, sort of towards the end of my PhD is when I started realizing that uh, um, astrophysics is is kind of more fun than than pure theoretical physics, and uh, um, um, or at least yields itself well to. Um, the kind of back of the envelope calculations that I was enjoying. Uh -huh. I have to say that perhaps, um, you know, one of the reasons that yields itself well, in my personal view, is that it's the data often are sufficiently imprecise that a back of the envelope calculation is good enough. Whereas if you're doing some, you know, scattering amplitude calculation, you really have to do it properly uh, to, you know, five significant figures because that's the kind of effect you might be looking for, right? Four, so five, six loops. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So we know we're we're a bit lucky in that regard. But this particular calculation was uh, trying to look at um, how often you might be able to um, detect um, gravitational waves from uh, black holes involving an intermediate mass black hole, a binary black hole system involving an intermediate mass black hole. Let's say at the center of a globular cluster that was eating up some lower mass compact objects like neutron stars or stellar mass black holes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very cool. We will find that and we will put a link to it in the uh, description below the video when we do that. And read Ilya's first. Thank you. Paper. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so that was 2008, you say? I think so. Okay. Uh, so 2008. And so uh, we will sort of fast forward 12, 13 years or so. Um, and at some point, I guess about a year ago, you became a scientific editor. Um, I'm always curious what people's motivation for doing that is, that kind of service work. So, so why did you decide to become a scientific editor? How did you become a scientific editor? How, what was that process? So I think, as you say, it was, it was you know, I think all of us try to, to somehow contribute back to the community, which is, has been, at least in my experience, very generous and nurturing to me. And uh, this was one way in which I personally thought I could make a hopefully useful contribution. Um, I also have to say that, that, you know, of course, there are selfish aspects to all of this. So for me, one of them was that I would be forced to take a closer look at the literature in my field. I know this is an embarrassing thing to say, oh, especially no. for, a, for a scientific editor, but I'm actually not very good at reading papers in a sort of consistent way. I'm not one of those people who gets up in the morning and spends an hour on uh, uh, oh. archive just checking. No. Some of my colleagues do that, and they oh, sort of religiously every day. You know, it's like you know the way that they have breakfast and or do their their you know morning workout. They they spend an hour on on uh, um, oh. archive, but just as important for them as brushing their teeth. Um, I cannot bring myself to do that, and I think part of the my own excuse to myself is because I really enjoy just deriving things from first principles. When I read the paper already, it's sort of it's all out there for me. Somebody else has already done this. I don't mind if somebody else has beaten me to it, but I want to be have the freedom to reinvent the wheel. And 
it doesn't matter if my wheels are, are triangular rather than circular, but at least, you know, I, I learned something in the process. And when, when it's already all beautifully written out for me, exactly, it's sort of, it's, it doesn't quite give me the same joy of, of discovery, even right. though I'm very happy for the person who has figured it out or the people who have, who have uh, so nicely written it up. So, but, but being an editor sort of forced me to do that. And I love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was um, that was actually one of my original and still primary motivations for for doing it. Um, I developed quite a quite a habit um, reading the published literature um, when I was a grad student, and I was really voracious about it. Um, and I hate to say it, but it goes back to the days before the internet. And so you had to break out these big books and you look in the index and you trace a line through the literature and you hand these two stacks of, you know, 10 high of the, the literature as you're chasing some line. I had great fun doing that. Um, but I found is that I, I went on, I was reading the literature less and less because, you know, life comes in. Um, uh, and so my, one of my original motivations was, was much like yours and that it was going to uh, make me read the literature again, which I didn't really mind. <laughs> I actually liked it, but it was a, you know, an extra motivation to, to do so. Now it was a responsibility or a duty or a service to, to do. So um, yeah, so I totally, totally agree with that. It's very good. Um, so what does a scientific editor do? What do you do? So, um... In the morning, I look at my email and I see that uh, uh, the lead editor, Frank, or sometimes perhaps uh, one of the other um, editors uh, of uh, some of the other quarters that I may be involved in, or maybe an editor, Fred Razio, who's the, the um, editor of, of FJ Letters, um, mm -hmm. sends me an email um, uh, saying, hey, Ilya, would you like to read this paper? And uh, in general, they uh, know very well the kinds of papers, or would you like to rather be an editor for this paper? I misspoke. And I, in general, they, they know my tastes uh, very well. So uh, I almost invariably say yes. And uh, then I look at the paper and uh, I uh, um, try to make a judgment for who might be reasonable referees for this particular paper. Um, mm -hmm. Often, um, it's if the paper is in a field that I'm very familiar with, I already have the names of some potential referees at my fingertips. Now, sometimes it might turn out that as I check, it turns out that those referees are either currently already involved in, in editing or refereeing another paper, or maybe just recently finished a big refereeing assignment. And in yeah. that case, I try to give them a break and I think some more. Sometimes if a paper is a little bit, uh, you know, more tangentially related to the fields I work in, I, I don't immediately come up with good names. And then I do a little bit of a search um, of the relevant literature to find, uh, you know, who might be um, promising referees. Um, then I get in touch with the referees. Uh, I very much hope that the referees respond promptly with either a yay or a nay. Uh, nays are perfectly understandable. I know oh, yeah. that people are very oh, busy. Yeah. Um, it's harder when people are so busy that they cannot respond uh, to the request to referee. Uh, you know, then then uh, I have to you know sort of follow up and simultaneously mm. try to contact a few other alternative referees. Eventually, hopefully, I find. Uh, um, one or sometimes two, depending on the paper, uh, referees that are um, that are going to be great. And uh, I wait for a while until their responses come back. Uh, if need be, ping them occasionally if uh, uh, they're a little bit busy and forget about the deadline. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. then once the reports come in, um, try to um, uh, make a judgment based on, on the report and uh, my own um, looks at the paper um, and uh, make send recommendations to the authors. Um, Sometimes um, that can be very simple, just essentially forwarding on the referee report. Sometimes it requires a little bit more editing of the report or a little bit of a back and forth with the referees. Uh, I can discuss uh, maybe in, in a moment what, what, what I mean by that. And then uh, ultimately wait for the authors to come back with, with uh, their revisions um, and their responses to the report. And if need be, iterate a few more times and hopefully in the end, uh, bring a paper to publication that's been improved thanks to the hard work of the referee and the hard work of the authors and responding to the referee's reports. And the hard work of the scientific editor. <laughs> I, I think of myself as just as a sort of a facilitator, essentially, you know, right. I, I'm, I'm like the moderator of a discussion between the, the, the referees and the, uh, and the authors, uh, hopefully um, just trying to, to, to make the paper even a little bit better. Of course, most papers are already great at the time they're submitted to, to WS journals, but we can always hope to improve them a little bit. And if, it, if that works out, I'm happy. Very cool, very cool. Um, 
Yeah, one of my favorites is when you ask somebody to referee and you don't hear about them. They never respond, but as soon as you find somebody and they get the message that you found another reviewer, they immediately respond. <laughs> yes, <laughs> my go, oh boy. That very often. <laughs> Lovely. Um, so let me drill down a little bit on that process that you talked about. So, so a manuscript comes in, uh, and and what do you think makes for a, a good, solid initial submission for a manuscript? So this is a tip for authors, right? What makes a good submission uh, in in your view? So I think, I mean, the vast majority of, of uh, manuscripts actually probably already fall into that category, but I think uh, the, um, so they are manuscripts that are, that have an interesting idea, the idea is clearly developed, um, there is a uh, reasonable um, review of the appropriate literature and connections to, to um, other work in the field, um, there's a reasonable discussion of the caveats and the uncertainties, um, it's worth pointing out, by the way, that's one thing that referees will often pick up on that, that authors, um, I think sometimes in a uh, desire to highlight the importance of their work will uh, um, sort of make maybe emphasize the, the, their advances um, a little bit too much and not necessarily discuss in, in sufficient detail that they had to make some approximations, they had to make certain right. assumptions. And that's absolutely understandable. Yeah. Um, astrophysics is a very hard, uh, uh, science and and of course we inevitably have to you know things are never perfect our data are never perfect our models are never perfect but referees will quite rightly pick up on the on um, um, the fact that sometimes if that's done to the ex exclusion of a proper discussion of some of the uncertainties some of the assumptions being made um, that's sort of where a lot of the back and forth comes in and so I think that's that's one thing that you know authors yeah the authors say up front that that you know this is we we've made this particular these the following assumptions, but you know we understand that those assumptions may not be perfectly valid. And in fact, if they are not exactly valid, then our answers may in fact change. That will not make their manuscript unsuitable. In fact, Absolutely. it will make it actually more suitable. Yeah. So so they, they, you you know authors don't shouldn't feel like they have to oversell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. Yep, very good. Um. So you look at this pretty good manuscript that discusses all its uncertainties and limitations and caveats, um, and you select uh, a referee, and then the referee goes off and makes a report. Um, and do you have any tips for referees on what makes for a good referee report? So this is actually something that I, I learned after becoming an editor, that I right. myself was not writing very good reports. Okay. Um, and it was, it's very interesting uh, being an editor sort of, you know, reading what the reports look like and then also understanding that when you see a report and you see, especially, you know, there are some reports, for example, that you realize, okay, this is going to be perhaps not perfectly constructive because it is going to raise some, you know, the, the hairs in the back of the referee's neck or the author's neck oh, and, yeah. uh, you know, we'll just end up with a, you know, uh, personal debate instead of a, uh, um, an improvement in paper, which is really the goal of the process. So one thing right. that I learned is that it's really a good idea. Um, I would almost, you know, now having done this, I, I, I'm not saying that this is a requirement, but I would say that it's a good idea to always talk about the manuscript and not the authors. Correct. Because, and I myself have done this. I would, I've written reports where I say, you know, the authors have done this, but um, it's much better to say the manuscript does this because right. Whenever somebody says the authors have done this, it's very easy to then follow up with, you know, perhaps, you know, the authors have not surveyed the literature, perhaps because they're not sufficiently familiar with it. Now, that's not at all, you know, an, you know, an appropriate uh, approach. And of course, I will not actually forward that kind of yeah, report on the authors. Uh, and uh, uh, the, but, but even if it's not done quite in that way, you know, there's always this, this sort of, you know, implicit judgment of, the authors, when you start with talking about what the authors have done, what the authors haven't done, and so on. And this is not a grant proposal review. This is not a promotion review. This is a review of a paper. And right. so the review of the paper should really focus on only what's done in the paper and should leave out any assumptions the referee might make. Ideally, don't make any assumptions at all. But even if you do, you know, that's on you and leave that out of your report. Any assumptions you make about the motivation right. of the authors, why the authors have done certain things, um, why the authors have failed to do certain things. You know, the authors have a, have made a, if there's a typo in the manuscript, say there's a typo in the manuscript, don't say that the authors have 
not bothered proofreading it carefully enough or, or you know, things of that sort, right? Because that's- yeah, Don't associate yeah. motivation exactly. with it, right? But, exactly. but, but your, your point is, uh, is very well taken um, uh, in that you generally want to depersonalize your reports. So I really like that, that you said, refer to the manuscript, the manuscript. The manuscript does this, the manuscript does that, um, as opposed to what the authors do, because then it, it immediately personalizes it. Um, and if you just go a lot more neutral, your reports will be better. You will see better improvement from authors when you do it. So yeah, um, go neutral on, on what you're referring to. Absolutely. And I guess the, the one other thing that I that is worth saying is that that um, you know it's worth keeping in mind that um, on the science on the science that was more in the presentation on the science side, um, uh, I think the report has two goals, and especially if it's a relatively negative report, it has two goals. One is to help the authors improve their paper, mm -hmm. um, and one is to help the editor make a an informed judgment. Because ultimately, yes, sometimes the paper may genuinely have made some fundamental mistake or have some fundamental flaw that renders it um, mm -hmm. um, unsuitable for publication. Um, mm -hmm. But it's worth keeping in mind for the author, for the uh, for the referee rather, that that the editor has perhaps doesn't have quite the level of expertise that the referee has, and that's why we, we ask the referee. Yeah. Also, the editor generally will not have looked at the paper in the same detail that the referee, that the referee will have done. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's very useful to have precise information about what the flaws are. So sometimes, you know, the reports come in which say something like, you know, the, the paper is irrevocably flawed, I recommend against publication. And I look at it and I say, okay, um, this is, I'm, this is this may be true, but I'm unfortunately this is not at all a report I can do anything with yeah. because I don't know what is wrong. The authors don't know what is wrong. Um, the authors maybe maybe their editor is right or the referee is right, but at least the authors would would maybe the authors will agree that they made a mistake, but they would at least like to know what their mistake is. And I certainly wouldn't feel um, comfortable rejecting a paper like without that. some without myself feeling like I understand what the flaw is. Um, so there needs to be enough information. And of course, it, I'm not, you know, this may be sort of a too generic of an example, but often, mm -hmm. you know, the authors will, or the referees will, will say that, you know, uh, you know, section X of the paper is, uh, uh, um, you know, very uh, uh, confusing. And again, you know, with no, okay, that again may be a true statement, but but in what way is it confusing? So provide some, provide some information, provide enough detail that, yes. that the authors can, either the authors can, work with something and and know what they need to improve or um that you know i as an editor can make a, an informed judgment about the paper but it, there really has to be some some meat to this discussion right Act, preferably actionable absolutely right if you know section x needs this this and this to be better great exactly uh, but just telling me section x yeah. is terrible doesn't tell me anything <laughs> right um yeah, and I'll just follow it up. Um, and so then the authors get their get the report, uh, and we have several videos on how to handle those reports. Um, uh, but I want to I want to emphasize when you reply that you should take that same advice that that Ilya gave about um, depersonalizing your reply. Don't talk about the referee because that immediately makes it personal, <laughs> right? Talk about the report. The report says this, the report says that. So re refer to the report and not the referee. Um, it's a tactical advantage to you as well. So, because you're having a discussion with the editor. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, and you never want to, I mean, as an editor, I, I would never want to see uh, uh, the referees and the authors get into a uh, ad hominem debate with each other. I, uh -huh. I, I'm hoping that the, you know, again, the process, the goal of this whole process is to improve the paper ultimately. Exactly. Exactly. But some people just can't help themselves, and this is where you have to come in and redact. Um, and and you know, it's it's those that take the most time. <laughs> Absolutely, which is actually one reason why I I personally, if at all possible, prefer if the reports are from the referees come in as text rather than PDF files. Some, okay. some referees send PDF files and that makes it very difficult, of course, to edit things. Sometimes I've had to, you know, copy paste things from, from PDF files uh, because right. I need, I did feel the need to make some, some editorial comments, but, or editorial changes, but uh, um, you know, there's no way to easily do that on a, on a submitted PDF. So it's, so it's uh, um, yeah, it's generally speaking, you know, there are, there can be exceptions where of course, you know, the, um, 
uh, referee uh, actually contributes some some plots, for example, or or uh, yeah, you know, or an independent analysis. That, but, but, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, but in general, mm -hmm. plain old good old plain ASCII text is perfectly great. <laughs> okay. um, absolutely, very cool. Uh, yeah, and then the process goes, and ultimately the scientific header makes makes a decision. Um, do you have anything else that you'd like to share about the, the peer review process, uh, either from a referee side, an author side? Um, yeah, maybe the staff side. We have a great set of staff. We have Janice and Alex, who are absolutely fantastic. They, they are absolutely amazing. I, uh, you know, I, uh, uh, I don't know what, what uh, uh, we would do without them. And, and yeah, they're incredibly helpful. They're, they're, they uh, uh, work incredibly hard and uh, you know respond very very quickly to all of our queries and issues and uh, especially when i was starting out they were they were wonderfully supportive and helpful when i you know made a few mistakes with the system uh, uh, and yeah. and so on and you know they they rescued me from from uh, uh, my mistakes uh, so yeah they they've been wonderful um i mean the only other thing that's that's worth saying is that uh, maybe you know some authors get sometimes very um frustrated when um reports get delayed or you know they they, yes, they, do. they sort of say well you know we expect you know i you know we've heard that there's a 10-day uh, turnaround in an mg letter for example you know it's been 11 days and we haven't heard or had a report yet what happened right and 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 of course you know the, the reality is okay first of all you know it can take uh you know a couple of days to even find the, the referee um and then you know sometimes uh, referees are also human you know things happen uh, they may have a sudden deadline they may fall ill uh, uh, and so on. We try, of course, um, you know, yep. we, the, the, uh, the editors are always on the lookout for reports that are overdue. So it's not that we, we don't forget about things. Uh, uh, there are even automatic reminders, even if we were to forget that the referees right. get uh, uh, that their reports are due. But, you know, usually I uh, tend to follow up separately uh, 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 in any case. Uh, but, you know, sometimes there are just, you know, situations wh which, uh, um, you know, there are force majeure situations and, and uh, uh, reports will sometimes be late. And uh, I would just like the, the, to ask the authors to be, to be patient uh, when such things happen. At Very the same good. time, of course, I would like to ask the referees to, to be timely and to be realistic about uh, their promises. Uh, so uh, you know, if the referee knows that they have a very major grand line coming up in, in, uh, ten, in exactly 10 days, maybe you know, this is not the best time to agree to, to, to referee an MG letter, which, which also has a, a 10 day turnaround time. So, uh, right. uh, you know, it's fine to say that, uh, I'm, you know, I'd love to referee a paper, but not, not on this occasion, because I have this major deadline coming up probably mm -hmm. better than, than, uh, being, uh, uh, two weeks later in the report. Uh, yes, particularly for a letter. Um, yeah, we like to turn those letters over, but, uh, but yeah, patience is a good thing in the peer review process. So it's a human game. We play it. And so sometimes it doesn't go exactly to schedule. So have a little patience on both sides. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Ilya, anything else you'd like to share? Um, I don't think so. I, I, I think I'm, uh, it was a wonderful, uh, Chat, but I think um, this is the the so far that the you've you've plumbed the full depths of my wisdom about uh, the <laughs> WS editorial process. Oh, I don't know about that. That sounds like an order of magnitude estimate. <laughs> Just to loop Absolutely. back. Uh, no, well, full depth you. within within plus or minus a factor of ten. You're exactly okay, right. Sure, order of magnitude. There you go. Um, no, no, no. So, uh, uh, no, I think you've been a fantastic scientific editor over the past year, and I certainly appreciate your your ability to handle uh, GW orientated manuscripts, which of course is a is a booming field uh, these days. And so, having some some expertise there is really great. And I would like to personally wish you a very happy. Um, and successful scientific editor career over the next 10 years, whatever end may be. Well, thank you very much for that, Frank. And, and uh, thanks again for uh, um, welcoming me to the WS uh, editorial family and uh, um, for uh, being such a wonderful lead editor and now uh, uh, associate chief editor. For, uh, so congratulations uh, once again. And uh, I uh, very much look forward to, to continuing to work with you. Yes, and I will probably see you uh, in Pasadena for AAS 240. Awesome.
because we've never actually met. We've never met in person. So this is, <laughs> this is actually the first time we've actually seen each other. So it'll be really cool to, to see you in person. Wonderful. And that will do everyone. And I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better. And we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Goodbye.